Okay, perfect. We are now live streaming. Okay. And then I'm going to start letting folks in. Perfect. One second. I'll be right back. I'm just going to. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. I see people like popping up in the, um, already coming into the call. Thank you, or the meeting, thank you so much. Let me just put in the chat, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Feel free to, uh, in the chat box, share your name, where you're from, your pronouns and what brings you here. Obviously you're here to hear it from Ms. Stella Dotsi and Karima Ali. So we're very excited to uh, have both of them here. And we'll be getting started soon. Your name. So we're gonna wait for a few more minutes so more folks can come in. Oh, hey Zola from Seattle, Washington. Nice to meet you. Thank you for being here. Okay, great. Give like a couple, one more minute or so. Hi there, Christy from Toronto, originally from the Netherlands. Thank you for being here. Wow. Hi, Wadia. Nice to meet you. Thank you for being here. Sonia from New Jersey. Hey, hey. Great. Oh, hi, Fatima from the Netherlands. Hey, how are you doing? Bridget from Canada. Wow, we have so many people. East Orange, New Jersey, Kimberly from NYC, big fan of Stella's book. Us too, us too. Hold on, we're just bringing these out. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Wow, thank you from joining from Montreal, from Hungary. Wow, thank you, thank you. Great, great, great. So we're going to get started. Um, I'm super excited today to be introducing um, and being in conversation with Ms. Stella Dodsey and Karima Ali. Um, first and foremost, my name is Jamie Swift. I am the Executive Director of Black Men Radicals. Uh, if you're not familiar with, with Black Men Radicals, we are a Black feminist advocacy organization dedicated to uplifting Black women and gender expansive people's radical activism in the African diaspora. Um, like I said, we're here today to have a conversation with Stella Dodsey about her latest book, A Kick in the Belly, Women, Slavery and Resistance. And we also have here the wonderful Karima Ali, who is a freelance photographer, curator and fellow um, at the Black Cultural Archives. This event is supported by the Black Cultural Archives and we're, I'm really grateful um, to have this collaboration and connection with such a powerhouse uh, organization. Before we really get started, I just wanna lay some ground rules down. Um, I do this every event. This is a safe space, right? And so this means we do not accept any transphobia, homophobia, queerphobia, misogynoir, racism, white supremacy, you name it, I don't accept it in this space. So if you act in a way that is um, not conducive to these guidelines, I will kick you out. Um, and have no problem doing that. So just want to make that clear. So let's get started into the with the event. First and foremost, let me introduce Ms. Stella Dotsi, who is best known for her co-authorship of The Heart of the Race, Black Women's Lives in Britain, which won the 1985 Martin Luther King Award for Literature and was recently republished by Verso as a feminist classic. 
She is a founder member of OWAD, the Organization of Women of African and Asian Descent, a national umbrella group that emerged in the late 1970s as part of the British Civil Rights Movement and was recently described as one of the grandmothers of Black feminism in the UK. Her career as a teacher, writer, artist, and education activist spans over 40 years. So thank you so much, Ms. Dodsey, for being here with us. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me, Jamie. Thank you. And next up, we have the wonderful Karima Ali, who is a freelance photographer, curator, and doctoral researcher. Her current project is entitled Exploring the History of Black Women's Mental Health Organizing in Britain from the 1970s to Present Day. And she is a, the, a current doctoral fellow at the Black Cultural Archives. Uh, she's also the co-founder of the collective Black British Girlhood and Thicker Black Lines. Her photographic work has been exhibited in a number of independent and public institutions, including Autograph, ABP, and the Tate Modern. She is also on the board of trustees for the art initiative, Idol Women, and has a background in working with African Caribbean communities within the mental health sector. So thank you so much, Karima, for being here as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank yes. you so much, Bella, for being here today. Really yes, glad. so excited. And also I want to give a shout out to Rhoda. Boateng. Yes. Yes. Thank you for organizing um, this event, even though you didn't want to be on screen, but I'll get you one day. Um, <laughs> anyway, I want to kick it off to Karima so she can explain more about the Black Cultural Archives. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly share my screen so I can do the presentation. Um, I'm going to do it this way. So if I go on to, yeah. So Jamie, can you see that? Can everyone see that? it looks great yes yes yeah. okay perfect thank you so much okay so um i'm going to be talking a bit about the black cultural archives um the founding of the black cultural archives and what we do and then we're gonna i'm gonna have some archives of miss stella's up um as we go throughout the talk um and we ask questions um and so yeah so let me start with uh, I am a doctoral fellow at the Black Cultural Archives. Um, my research is kind of looking at the um, Black women's movements archives that they have there. Uh, and so, yeah. So the Black Cultural Archives was founded in 1981 by Len Garrison, which you can see here. Um, he was a historian and an educationalist. Um, and he was also the founder and director of the African Caribbean Education Research Project, also known as ACER. And they were an independent educational charity um, that researched and developed, um, produced learning materials for um, black kids in um, Sunday schools, especially. Um, and so the Black Cultural Archives was really born out of a community response to what was happening in the local community and across England with Black in the African Caribbean community. And so especially following the Brixton uprisings, um, the underachievement of Black children in British schools was a, a, what Len Garrison was really, really passionate about. And especially, of course, the wider endemic racism that Black people were facing in Britain daily. Um, so he was really passionate about creating a space where members of the community, you know, could find positive rep representations of themselves in history and culture um, to kind of sort of collate a, a national museum and archive. Um, and here's actually the early days of the Black Cultural Archives um, at the Black People's Day of um, Action in 1981. Um, so the archive is, is situated in London, in Brixton, which is a historically, um, a post-war um, migration community lives there in Brixton, um, predominantly African Caribbean. And so um, the actual location of the archives was really important because it then meant that the, it could be a part of the local community. Um, and it's the only national heritage center in England, um, in the UK dedicated to collecting, preserving and celebrating the histories of African and Caribbean people in Britain. Um, and so we house a number of collections, including oral archives, uh, many of them from the women of the Black Power Movement in Britain, which is one of my favorites actually. Um, and so, yeah, so um, actually Dadsy's, Stella's archive is actually one of the most visited at our collections, um, which is, you yeah, know, great. Uh, and so that's kind of a bit of the history um, of the Black Cultural Archives. You can kind of see a picture of it here. This is a wider picture of Brixton in general, but 
we have the archives down here. Okay, so can I move, give it to you, Jamie? Yes, thank you so much for sharing about um, the Black Cultural Archives. And like Karima said, we are going to be having a more extensive conversation with Ms. Dodsey about her archives. Um, and it's not a surprise that her archives are the most visited archives. Um, hopefully I get to <laughs> make it there one day. So let's get started off um, with questions about Ms. Um, Stella's, Ms. Dodsey's latest book, A Kick in the Belly. Um, and I hope everyone purchases this book um, and we'll send, we'll put a link or I'll put a link into the chat so you can purchase um, and learn more about Ms. Dodsey's latest work. So um, our first theme of the conversation is documenting African Caribbean women's resistance um, and looking at a kick in the belly as a theoretical and political intervention. So um, what I love about your work, Ms. Dodsey, is that you are very unwavering in your praxis in regards to uplifting and centering Black women's leadership, resistance, and more across various sec sectors. So my question for you is with the kick in the belly, why was it so important to focus on enslaved African women's resistance in the Caribbean? And also how was the process of writing this book different from uh, the other, other uh, books that you worked on, but particularly The Heart of the Race? Well, hi, Jamie, and hi, everyone who's listening. Um, you know, if you live in Britain um, and have had the kind of education that most people here are exposed to, um, which is basically, you know, Black History Month, White History Year, um, what you find is that there's a comfort in focusing on racism and, his, and racist histories that um, aren't owned. So there's been a tendency over the years to, to focus on American history. And for many of our young people, the little they know about slavery, um, it tends to be based on, on, on a fairly stereotypical image of slavery as people experienced it in the United States and in the Southern States of America. Um, so part of the motivation for writing the, A Kick in the Belly was to correct that narrative, to highlight the role of women in the West Indies, the British West Indies who, who were enslaved and um, also to just remind people that there are many hidden histories and um, it's important for us to know each other's history and to interrogate each other's history, to draw the comparisons, but also to recognize the differences, you know, and there were some quite significant differences in terms of how slavery developed in those two respective areas. So um, I think, you, you know, you're dealing anyway, aren't you, with a, with a history of glorious white male conquest you know, <laughs> wherever you start. Um, but we need to move beyond just trying to say we were here as well to understanding the nuance, um, which will empower us, I think, in, in the long term. Understanding our differences is part of the endeavor that is ongoing to appreciate our commonalities as well. Um, in terms of your second question, um, what was, different, why was it important, sorry, what was what was different about writing A Kick in the Belly, I think you asked me. Um, I suppose with the heart, of the, uh, uh, the heart of the Race, we were dealing with um, interviews with live women. Um, we were able to interview around 100 or so women through the various networks and grapevines that we had in place at the time. And of course, when you, you're writing a historical piece, you don't have access to that. And in fact, you know, one of the um, things we could lament um, um, about the, the um, period after slavery was, was abolished is the fact that in America, I think people went around and actually made a con conscious effort to record the narratives of enslaved people before they died out. That wasn't done in the Caribbean. So we have very little first person um, accounts of how it was. We have Mary Prince, who, who um, ended up in Britain and was taken under the wing of the abolitionists. So she was able to tell her story. 
Um, there were lots of efforts to discredit her story, but it, it, it's a very authentic account. Um, we have Mary Seacole, who was um, our equivalent of, of Florence Nightingale. You know, she went over and, and um, was a nurse during the Crimean War. But apart from that, we're pretty de dependent on the, the, the accounts that have been left to us by white men in their diaries, in their letters, in their plantation records. So I suppose the difference in terms of writing A Kick in the Belly was that you really had to listen to the music behind the words in order to unearth the voice of black women. And I think that was my endeavor to do that using those sources, using how they saw us to present a different narrative, which is very rarely done. Definitely, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, overcoming these revisionist, white, white patriarchal heteronormative capitalist revisionist histories and, and as a political intervention. So thank you so much. Karima, uh, would you like to add to that? Um, I really loved reading A Kick in the Belly. Um, it was really refreshing to read from that perspective. And I wanna talk a bit about the, cause the trajectory of the history examined in this book is really important. Um, and I see A Kick in the Belly as being part of a narrative of kind of resisting that incomplete version of history that we're taught, um, particularly in schools here in the UK, where barely taught anything about our past. And so keeping in mind that recent, um, there was a recent Histo Royal Historical Society report a few years ago that kind of highlighted that black historians make up only like less than 1% of black, black professors in the UK. Um, I mean, I can think off the top of my head only a few. And so a lot of that has to do with the way our history has been erased and repackaged, especially in the academy. Um, so how important is I wanted to ask you accessibility in your own praxis, um, especially writing this book, and, and what impact do you hope that a kick in a belly will have on the generations to come? Um, accessibility is absolutely vital for me. I, I, I always wonder who we think this history is for. You know, um, it was Marcus Garvey who said, a people without knowledge of their history, roots and culture is like a tree without roots. So my starting point is, if I'm gonna engage with this history, I need to do it in a language that is accessible and which enables people who may not have been to university or studied at a postgraduate level, it allows them access to that history the same way. Now, um, I've always seen academia, maybe this is unfair, but I think many women that I know who work in universities will agree with me that academia tends to be a bit of a closed shop. You know, language is used to mystify um, our understanding of what's going on. And I think class and uh, yeah, class, excludes people from those circles often. It's changing, slowly it is changing, but that still tends to be the norm. And so, although I've engaged with this, this history at, at a postgraduate level, um, um, I don't see myself as an academic, I see myself as a teacher. I've always worked in education, um, both as a teacher of young people and adults, and also as a teacher of teachers and educators. So. I've seen it from all angles and it strikes me that, um, you know, the way the story of slavery is told in schools um, has traditionally been quite problematic. You know, it's a story of victimhood. And I was very struck a few years ago, I think I mentioned it in the book, actually in the introduction, um, about a report um, describing how a group of African Caribbean pupils um, were really unhappy about being taught about slavery in school, in their history lessons, and actually made a complaint. And, you know, it made me think quite hard about, well, what is it about the way this story is being told that makes it so unpalatable, you know? 
when we think about the story of the Holocaust, or if we think about the story of heroic resistance in, in any context, you know, um, it is that, that resistance that makes people feel empowered and makes people want to own that history, you know. Um, and traditionally, when we think about the story of a slavery, it's quite often told as a story about people who were denied any agency, who had no um, control over their own lives or their own futures. So it was really important to me to write a book that corrected that, which showed women as having a history, as having a past, as having strengths upon which they could build, um, albeit that they came naked on, on, the sh on the ships, they brought with them those cultures, that knowledge of what it meant to be a woman, a black woman, an African woman. And a kick in the belly is an attempt to show that we were not only kicked in the belly through that experience of enslavement, but we actually kicked back. Um, in terms of the legacy to future generations, I guess um, for me, it's important that um, young people do feel empowered by their history and um, that they recognize that this is one of, of many untold stories that has to be unearthed. Um, and I also hope it shows them that history is about more than kings and queens and dead white males. You know, history is often made by the unvoiced and the invisible. And I think, I hope that this book will, will also give them that sense that, that history is theirs and theirs to make what they will of. Definitely, thank you for sharing that. And also like um, your response has kind of flowed into my, uh, other question about her stories and black women's resistance, but even in uh, the heart of the race, you really reference a lot, Nanny of the Maroons and, and um, you mentioned, like you said, Mary Prince and a kick, a kick in the belly. Um, and I'm gonna redirect the question um, and, and just offer, you know, wanting to know your thoughts on this. Um, for me, when I found out certain black women historical figures like uh, I don't know, Ella Baker or Marsha P. Johnson or, you know, uh, Claudette Colvin, like these, these giants that were not taught to me in class. When I finally found out about them, I was so um, hurt in a sense, but also very happy. But it took me so long to get here. It was like they were purposely trying to erase myself um, and, and all these other Black women who came before me. So when writing these books, how did it feel to come across this information of like about Nanny of the Maroons, like this obey a woman who was a freedom fighter and fought off the British and Mary Prince and amongst others. Um, how did that make you feel when you came into like this consciousness of, of historical black women leaders and resistors? Um, yeah. I guess I'm going to have to think back quite a, a few years, Jamie, because obviously, you know, the research that I've been doing in this area goes back literally to, to the mid 80s. So I'm, I'm thinking back and I guess like all of us, you know, it is heartening, empowering, inspirational to know that there were women like that who, who, who resisted the tide and who are remembered for their courage and their resilience. Um, it is so important, isn't it, that our sons and daughters grow up with images like that because it's a message to them that, that is basically saying, you too can be like this. Now, it was really important for me, I think people, because of the, the, the areas that I've, I've looked at in, in the two books that you've mentioned anyway, um, tend to focus primarily, but not exclusively on, on the Caribbean. People often think that I'm of Caribbean origin, I'm not. Um, my father was Ghanaian. So for me, those, those, those cultural links and those cultural continuities are really not just fascinating, but really important. 
they show um, not just a resilience, but a kind of staying power that is almost mind boggling, you know, that despite all the efforts to squash cultures and, and um, punish people for using their own languages and, and, and uh, their own cultural references, they still survived. That is a hugely empowering message. And um, when I look at women like Nanny or Cuba Queen of Kingston, or uh, Anna Nzinga, you know, some of the women who are mentioned in the book, Be Beatrice uh, uh, Kimber was another one. Um, what you see is women who, wherever they came from on the African continent, which was a huge, vast, complex place, you know, um, they all seem to have this sense of their own agency. Um, they all, had the capacity to rise up through the ranks. I'm not saying the society wasn't patriarchal, um, but what you see is evidence of women who had a sense of self, who were comfortable in their own skin, who could rise to positions of great spiritual and military power. And um, as I say, you know, even the youngest women who were dragged across the Atlantic on those ships um, will have gone through some kind of initiation process that enabled them to ground themselves themselves in that sense of self, you know? And it's that which we build on and that which we continue to build on to this day. Um, it, it, it's, it's so vital for us to, to know about those stories and to identify with those histories. Yeah, that it's that's one of the reasons why I really enjoyed um, a kick in the belly as a kind of historical document um, almost and so one of the things um, that I kept thinking about and one I love the way you interrogate gender and its complications throughout the book it's there from the first page um, and as I was reading it I was thinking about it in the context of what's happening um, in the UK right now, there's a discourse about how, there was a report last month that black British women um, die are four times more likely to die than white women, white British women um, during childbirth. And that, as I was reading it, that kind of, um, I was really, really amazed at the way that gender gets, you know, talked about throughout your book and especially also Heart of the Race. I know both the chapters are called Labour Pains. Um, and so, you talk about the ways in which maternity offered a form of resistance for enslaved women in chapter three of A Kick in the Belly, um, which is an amazing chapter. Um, how do you situate, I wanted to ask, this historical record in that wider conversation on our health as black women? Well, <clears throat> I've, I think I've already talked about the importance of, the, of recognizing the continuities. And I just see um, the kind of, statistics you're referring to, you know, I think they discussed it on Women's Hour just this week, didn't they? Um, the higher mortality rate of black yeah, women in, in hospitals in, in this country, and I suspect probably in America too. Um, when I, I hear that kind of discussion, it just takes me straight back <laughs> to, to those, those plantation stories. And um, you're referring, I think, um, Karima to um, a chapter which looks at how, um, to some extent, the whole project of slavery was dependent on black women's wombs functioning effectively, because once the Atlantic slave trade had been abolished, then of course, um, in order for slavery to survive, women had to be encouraged to breed. And um, unlike in America, where the birth rate did steadily rise over the centuries, what you see in many of the British West Indian uh, colonies is a steady decline, which had the planter class, the West India lobby, literally scratching their heads with frustration. And this was in a context of amelioration policies that were being introduced to encourage women to breed, everything from offering them um, financial rewards, time off from, from, from the fields, etc. Um, 
and incentives, incidentally, to stop them not just from um, um, taking abortants, um, but also to encourage them to stop weaning their children, for, you know, to wean their children much, much quicker, because that was seen as a natural prophylactic. So you see um, entries in the, in the diaries, you see discussions in the British Parliament, um, where, as I say, these men were literally scratching their heads and say, we're, we're doing everything we can, and yet the birth rate still continues to decline. And it is they themselves who begin to refer to black women taking abortants or not being bothered to breed for massa. Um, and you see that also in the court records as well. There was a, a reference to a woman, I think, in the book. I think her name was Sabrina Park, who, who, who said those very words, I will not be bothered to breed for massa. So there's a sense in which whether these women were consciously or subconsciously opposed to that project, they had a sense of their own agency and their own power. Um, so as I say, you know, if we look at what's going on today, we're really talking about a continuity, um, a sense that we have always, as black women, had to struggle for agency and control over our own bodies. And, and you know, if, if you're referring to some of the um, discussions in um, the heart of the race, you'll see the campaign against Depo Bavera, which was a, an injectable contraceptive that was used, we felt um, almost in a, a kind of um, almost genocidal way to discourage black women from breeding. Um, and you see um, engagements, discussions with what was the predominantly white women's movement at the time about the real meaning of a woman's right to choose, which is also the right to choose to have children as well as the right to choose not to. So, you know, all kinds of discussions that have, that have engaged us over the years and which I think to me just suggests that it's part, as I say, of an ongoing um, struggle to reclaim uh, 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 reproductive autonomy. Right, and I think it's also really important a lot of times that people don't think about um, reproductive justice in those terms. It's always, you know, it's the, either the right to choose or not, but they don't think about forced sterilization and all of these things as reproductive justice issues, or even police brutality as a reproductive mm. justice issue. The, mm. the right to, you know, have kids to grow up and live healthy lives, or the right to live in this world, you know, as a black person. Um, I wanted to talk a bit more about um, Heart of the Race and your kind of um, legacy and your history in working with the Black Women's Movement. Um, and so for me, I mean, Heart of the Race was one of the first books I really picked up that spoke to me at, at to and about Black women, black British women. Um, you don't find that many of them, at least um, a few, when I was in university. And so it's now been 35 years since its publication and it still reads as a contemporary sociological text, which tells us a lot about the things that have and haven't changed. Um, and you've mentioned before how the work you did during OWAD um, brought about the evolution and conception of Heart of the Race. Can you maybe talk a bit more about the political landscape at the time that allowed such a hit, rich her story um, to be compiled? And how do you see OAD as having played a role in that? Okay, um, political landscape at the time, I think um, Jamie mentioned it at the early, uh, in the introduction, we're talking about something that is actually not often referred to, the, 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 the civil rights movement that took place in this country. There's another example of how the focus tends to be on what happens in America, but actually there were struggles going on in, in Britain at the time, which very much resonated with the kinds of demands, the kinds of concerns, the kinds of issues that were being grappled with um, across the Atlantic. Um, we didn't have Jim Crow laws, we had a far more diplomatic lace curtain kind of racism at play. And by that, I mean, you know, you can literally visualize the prospective landlady pulling aside the lace curtain when she sees the black person standing on her doorstep. And instead of saying, go away, we don't um, allow niggers into this house, which I guess is what would happen in in the States, what they would say here is, sorry, the place just went. I'm so sorry. 
you know? So it's a kind of veiled racism that, that is just as insidious. So um, we're talking about a situation where black women were dealing with issues of police brutality, issues of reproductive violence, um, issues of educational disadvantage, of discrimination in employment, a whole range of um, concerns. And although those concerns were being um, taken up in a more generic way by the community organizations that existed at the time, they were very male dominated. Um, quite often for women to even raise those issues was seen as somehow divisive. So that was the context in which OAD arose. <laughs> you got my membership card there. Um, it was very quickly apparent to us that the issue, I mean, originally we were going to call it the women of women of Africa and African descent. And you can actually see, I, I recognize my writing there that we mm -hmm. crossed it out and put Asian because it was very soon apparent to us that the issues that women of Asian descent were facing in this country um, often um, overlapped or uh, were very similar to the issues that women of African and African Caribbean descent uh, were dealing with. Um, and of course, don't forget that some of the women who were coming to this country as Asian women were coming from East Africa, you know, in the context of Idi Amin and, and, and uh, what was happening in Tanzania. Those of you who don't uh, remember that, that, that period, there was, there was a whole Africanization uh, process going on in East Africa, which often meant the expulsion of Asian communities. So, as I say, there were a lot of um, issues that we felt as um, people growing up in this country, uh, we needed to address. But I think the other thing that was really important about the context is that many of us were first generation immigrants, second generation immigrants, we still had strong ties with our countries of origin. So we not just brought a female gaze to these issues, we also maintained an anti-colonial, anti-imperialist gaze. Um, and I think that enabled us to put our story into a more global context to understand the social and economic forces that were uh, impacting on our lives. And um, in that context, where we were working as women collectively to address um, the issues that concerned us, it was absolutely na a natural progression when we were, when I was approached by Virago um, publishers, a female publishers at the time, women's publishers, to see if we could produce a book that would be like a parallel to Amrit Wilson's book, Finding a Voice, which looked at the experience of Asian women, it was absolutely natural for me to take that back to the organization and say, hey, what do you think, should we do this? So the book actually started as a book collective. You know, there were quite a few women who were interested in, in getting our stories down and in, in ensuring that our voices were heard. But I think any woman who's engaged in the process of writing knows that actually writing as a collective is not that easy. And many people who would have wished to stay the course found themselves distracted by childcare, career, studies, etc. So in the end, it whittled down to, to the three of us. And um, yeah, it was, it was very much an attempt to, as I say, give black women a voice. It was not unheard of, but quite unusual at the time to tell history through oral history, you know, and the very fact that we interviewed women and encouraged women to tell their version of the story and simply wove our own analysis around it, um, using that collective we to show that ownership of the history and of the stories that were being told. I think to some extent that was a natural reflection of the way we were attempting to organize at the time in a way that was democratic in a way that recognized that everybody had their story and in a way that um, allowed women to determine what mattered to them. Definitely, thank you so much for sharing this. And it's like, 
the archives is looking at the archives um, really encapsulates everything. I'm sorry, Karima, did you have another follow-up that you wanted to, uh, to, to discuss with the archives before I jump in? I'm sorry, you're muted. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'm you showed a, a poster there, Karima, of, of um, the, the band The Jab. That was yeah. the... Um, the, let, me uh, put, let me put the post yeah, up. Put it up because, you know, um, we're dealing at the moment, aren't we, with a lot of mistrust in our communities around vaccination. And yeah. of course, this, this has a history. It has a context, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I'm not actually an anti-vacker. I've traveled backwards and forwards to Africa. I've always had to have my yellow fever jab and my hepatitis jab. So I guess for my generation, it doesn't seem quite so unusual to have to have a certificate to say you've been vaccinated. But mm -hmm. as I say, there is a context to people's mistrust and yeah, um, yeah. Um, there you see it, you know, back in the late seventies, there we were saying ban the jab, you know, another continuity. Um, and, and as I say, don't get me wrong. I, I, I think, I fear that the only way we're gonna get out of this pandemic is by, uh, through mass vaccination. And, and I'm horrified by the kind of vaccine nationalism that we're, we're seeing um, uh, evidence of. But nevertheless, I think for us as, as, as people who've been um, victims of medical experimentation and of, of, of quite cynical attempts to, to curtail our life chances, um, we, 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 we need to know our history and understand it in order to make sense of what's happening to us now. Yeah, there's a there's a contextual trajectory to the history of that mistrust, and that's really important to keep in mind, especially in the current discourse. Um, one thing about many of the groups that were operating in the late seventies and early eighties is in is the integrity and the power and the collective we um, that I find um, of the movement, um, which was really apparent. So it's really a stark difference to today's landscape where you know neoliberalism neoliberalism pushes for certain individuals to be faces of whole communities um and so how was this collectivism central to the work that you were doing at the time um and have done over the years um and i'm also really interested in the work you do have done over the years as an artist because if I don't, I don't know if people don't know but the cover of heart of the race was done by you um and i kind of wanted to know the work that you've done the work that you um how art plays a role in your uh, practice and also whether you see yourself as one so i don't know oh wow that was that was a multi-headed question um <laughs> How was collectivism central? Well, I, I think to some extent I've already spoken to that. I think um, um, many of us came out of organizations where there was an attempt to, to, to work in a collective way, either because people were Marxists or because they just felt that it was a more Afrocentric um, way of expressing our, our, our political agency. So, um, collectivism was really important. It was important to us as women as well, because as I say, a lot of us were uh, familiar with very male dominated organizations where there were hierarchies and egos at play. Um, and also we were women, you know, we had kids, we had other responsibilities. So we needed a kind of fluidity um, that enabled us to speak with a collective voice without relying too much on one or two individuals to do that. And I, I think, you know, um, over the years, I've seen people write papers about OAD and, and, and try to analyze um, it, its significance, but um, I've rarely seen much of a focus on that sort of women-friendly way of organizing. Um, I'm not saying it was perfect, you know, like all organizations that were isms and schisms, but I, I do think that 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 kind of commitment to the collective, that sense that nobody had the right to speak on behalf of themselves, they were speaking um, with the permission and on behalf of others and therefore needed to bring a degree of humility um, to the table and not assume that they had all the answers. Um, that to me is, is what collectivism 
continues to mean and and it is sometimes very much at variance with this kind of um, identity politics this this individualism that that uh, you've referred to i think um yeah uh, the way for us to to move forward is to get away from that <laughs> i really do think that um you asked me about my art oh dear um do I call myself an artist? Not often, sometimes, depends who's asking. Um, I've always um, painted and drawn. Uh, my mother was an artist um, and I was, for many years, although I have brothers and sisters for many years, I was raised as, a, as an only child and it was my go-to place. It was my sanctuary. It was a place of peace, a place of self-reflection and quite often an astonishing place because as anybody who, who creates art knows you sometimes aren't sure what's going to come out um years ago in the 90s uh, some of you may remember there was a, a, a horrendous war being waged in central europe the, um, in bosnia and uh, i was very privileged to work with women uh, who were literally um, dealing with, with that, that genocidal war. And we organized a, a, a women's study camp and there was art and, and mutual learning, each one teach one kind of thing going on. But one day I just took myself aside and decided to draw, to do a painting. And the painting literally came out of the, the, the spirit of, of what was going on there. And for me, it was really astonishing, you know, how if you really just allow yourself to dig deep and to, um, um, yeah, know yourself, um, art can be a really powerful way of, of expressing that. It's not just words, is it? It's not just books. Um, I'm always told off. My son is an artist. He's always telling me off and saying, you know, I should do more with it. But um, I think like a lot of sisters, you know, I juggle lots of balls and art is one of them. So when I find time to do it, I engross myself in it. I love to do it. But uh, right now, my focus is, is, is on writing. I mean, I for one would love to see more of your artwork and, and I hope to see that in the near future. Thank you. Yes, most definitely. When I remember when we had our interview and you told me that you did this this amazing artwork for the cover. I was like, wow, you just can do all sorts of things now. <laughs> um, and so um, my question for you, and then um, we can get to the Q&A portion because there are a lot of questions, but um, this event is a part of Black Men Radicals Afrofeminisms in Europe series, which is a political interrogation meditation and celebration of European Afrofeminisms and Black feminisms. My goal with Black Men Radicals is to be as transnational in my perspective as, uh, or in our perspectives as we possibly can. Um, and you've spoken throughout this conversation how often people look to the US context when it comes to radical Black movement building and the radical Black, black tradition. And me being a Black American, I understand um, the importance of Black American radical movement building, but oftentimes it is, uh, uh, we look overlook what Black people are doing in different parts of the world. And so um, at this political juncture, especially with all that is going on, what, how do you, like, what does uh, transnational Black feminist solidarities in your opinion look like between Black women in the United Kingdom um, black women and gender expansive people in the United Kingdom and black women and gender expansive people in the United States. What does that look like and what does that mean to you? You know, I think I'm not alone in feeling that globally we face some huge and really worrying challenges and there's a context for that which extends beyond any national boundaries. So it's really important that where we can organize collectively around our shared concerns, that we do so. Now, I happen to 
be old enough to remember um, the power of Pan-Africanism, um, the power of dialogue that extended across the diaspora, um, which allowed us to speak um, to our brothers and sisters in America and to have conversations with people in West Africa, South Africa, and across the African continent. That was hugely empowering and hugely important um, in our um, attempts, our endeavors to come out of colonialism and to um, deal with the world in, in, in the 50s and 60s. And I think, um, as with all history, it's really important to, to, to learn from our history and draw strength from what worked, you know. So in terms of transnational feminism, I think, unlike us, you, you, you guys are really lucky that you can talk to each other at the touch of a button. Look at us, you know, we're talking across an ocean and there's people from, I think somebody, uh, logged in who was who was from Hungary you know we have that instant connectivity and that allows us to really dig deep and and discuss almost on a daily basis those issues that concern us and to come up with ways of seeing those issues and ways of seeing the world that um, uh, give us give us a, a mean to come together now I don't know about everybody else, I, I've, I've watched the Black Lives Matter protests and part of me felt uplifted and pleased to see people coming out on the street and protesting, um, you know, continuing to protest police brutality. Um, this has been going on for too long and it needs to stop. But one of my concerns as, as, a, as a woman, as I say, of, of Ghanaian origin, is that as far as I'm concerned, Black Lives Matter wherever they are, you know? And what I would like to see is the same sense of outrage from other black women, if we're just talking about feminism, about gender mutilation, about sex trafficking, about the deaths of women who are struggling across the Sahara Desert and ending up on the bottom of the ocean in their endeavors to either flee war or poverty or just give themselves and their kids a better life. Those uh, migrant stories are very, very resonant with the story of the Middle Passage. And again, that's, import that's an important reason why we need to make that, those connections and uh, understand uh, the continuities in our history. Um, but yeah, if, 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 if I'm to answer your question in a nutshell, Jamie, transatlantic feminism needs to go beyond navel gazing. It needs to go beyond um, the superficial. And I'm not saying that issues of hair and, you know, whether we have um, skin colored sticking plasters, I'm not saying those issues aren't important and I'm not trying to trivialize the, 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 the kinds of issues that, that we've had to fight for here, but we have to make the connection. And we have to make the connection in a way that not only recognizes where we're from and recognizes that without a world in which everybody has access to equality and opportunity, none of us are gonna be free. Um, we need to recognize that, but we also need to recognize that um, those of us who are in the West sometimes have a louder, more powerful voice simply because of the technology we have access to and the fact that we take for granted food, clothing and shelter. So um, I think it's really important that we get our priorities right. And we recognize that some of the things that we focus on, and again, I say again, I reiterate this because I know people are gonna say, what does she mean? Um, some of the things we focus on um, would be less important, let me put it diplomatically, to a woman living on a rubbish tip in Lagos for whom just feeding her children and finding shelter tonight is the primary concern. And I think for me, if we are genuinely as, as women, as black women, 
going to come together and be a force, then we have to, we have to move beyond the navel gazing and recognize that, you know, this is a global movement. Definitely um, some critical words of wisdom that we really need um, at this point. Wow, I can't believe that we are already an hour within the program. It just feels like I could sit here for, I know Karima feels the same way, like at your feet, like listening to you and all these gems. I just wanna thank you so much for your time and um, everyone, please, I put the link in the chat, please support Ms. Dodsey and buy a kick in the belly, um, women's slavery and resistance, please support her critical work. Um, if you haven't read Heart of the Race, please read Heart of the Race. Please learn about how black women in Britain have been organizing for decades, for years, um, and, and their political context and their political perspective. So um, Karima, would you like to add anything before we get to the Q&A portion? I know, um, yeah, we have some questions. Yeah, I just wanted to, again, thank Stella for this amazing historical record. It's a real intervention um, in the history of slavery that we have so far in the academy, um, let alone as um, books that, you know, I, yeah, it's a it's a real it's a real honor to be able to have this conversation with you and talk this through, and so thank you. So I just want to reiterate and thank you, Jamie, so much for organizing all of this and you know making this happen. So yeah, this transatlantic conversation happen. Listen, I've been waiting for this moment for a long time. So um, <laughs> I've been you know I've spoken with Miss Dodzi before and just now to be able to see her and also. Um, with you, like your work is so important and I'm looking forward to reading your book one day as well. And yeah, I'm super excited about that. So yeah, so we have a few questions. Um, uh, yeah, we have a few questions. So Tanita Lewis um, from London asked, really enjoyed this talk, thank you so much. What avenues and groups would you suggest uh, to black women looking to actively contribute to black feminist aims and looking to find black feminist community community in the UK, particularly in London? Oh, that's, that's a hard one. Um, I was involved in a piece of work recently, is it Tanika? Um, where um, I was helping to shortlist um, for um, a fundraising exercise that was in uh, designed to um, uh, give support to black groups across Britain who were impacted by, by the pandemic. And one of the things that bowled me over was how many groups there are out there. And, um, you know, there are groups that are um, concerned as we were about black exclusions and what's going on in our schools. There are groups that are concerned about um, uh, uh, you know, discrimination in employment, you know, the whole gamut, I, I don't have, have to list them. And I think it's, it's really difficult, really. It's, it's, it's kind of confusing, isn't it? When you're trying to find your, 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 your center in all of this and, and say, where do I pin, pitch my energies? My, my honest answer is, I don't know, but I think it starts with some serious research. And it also starts with some serious soul searching because um, if you're like me, you'll find that you are most comfortable pitching your energies in the area in the, or the areas where you are most com where, where you're most knowledgeable or most likely to, 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 to uh, um, engage. Um, in my case, you know, I, I, I've always been a feminist. I've always been an anti-racist, but I was also a teacher. And that meant that a lot of my energies were put into work to support that whole project of decolonizing the curriculum and, um, you know, empowering schools to um, ensure that their, their, their black children had, had life chances. But with a feminist and anti-racist perspective brought to that discussion. So I don't think you necessarily have to even, you know, join a particular group you know, in order to do that, I think it starts with, you know, identifying where your interests are, where your passions are, 
where you want to pitch your energies and then finding like-minded souls who want to work together with you on that project. And uh, believe you me, you'll find people out there, you know. Um, one word of caution, I think, and that is that, you know, if you only engage with people who think and um, have the same goals as you in this kind of contained way, then you may find yourself um, excluded from conversations with others that you ought to be speaking to as well. So, um, you know, I'm not really, really supportive of this kind of cancel culture. Um, I think we need to continue to have a dialogue, even with people with whom we don't necessarily disagree, uh, sorry, with whom we don't necessarily agree, because that's how we grow, that's how we learn. Um, and all of us are beneficiaries of that process. Somebody taught us, somebody took the time and the patience to explain things to us. So, um, yeah, on the one hand, find, find like-minded souls, but on the other hand, don't just, don't just um, confine yourself to those discussions. Great, thank you. Thank you so much um, for that um, perspective. And so Nicole Soul asks, what are some books that you read earlier on that transformed your thinking? Oi. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, um, that is, I'm a prolific reader. So um, I'd find it really hard to, to pick out any particular books. I know um, if I think about, you know, back in the day in the, in the 70s, when we were just like really literally just beginning to discover that there was such a thing as black history, um, certainly books like um, um, Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa and, um, um, you know, books like um, Nkrumah's works um, really did kind of give me a, a grounding and a, and a sense of, of the African context for this, for this uh, situation that we're in. Um, I also found books like Staying Power by Peter Fryer and a whole range of books by Basil Davidson, both white male historians who bucked the trend. Um, really important um, in terms of giving myself a sense of how Africa connected with here. Um, uh, work by Franz Fanon, all of that stuff. I mean, really, um, the list is endless. But I should say that I think it's equally important to read fiction. Um, I think I was really privileged to, to have access to uh, the work of, of people like Toni Morrison and Maya Angelou um, and Alice Walker um, before they were published in this country. And um, more recently, you know, there's a whole number of writers coming from the African continent, too numerous to mention, you know, Chimamanda is one, but there, there are many others who, who just really are worth reading. You know, they give, give um, um, perspectives on these stories that are closer to home, that help us to understand the emotions as well as the kind of theories. Um, yeah, I, I just think reading is just a wonderful way to 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 gain insights into into our into our story and our journey. Um, we have another question here. Um, how do you feel about current liberation, anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-colonial activism in the UK? today um, and um, they also want to mention that they love a kick in the belly and a heart of the race um, and have it's been really helpful in how they look at history so thank you. Um, how do I feel about just repeat the beginning of the question again for me please. How do you feel about current liberation politics um, anti-racist anti-sexist anti-colonial activism in the UK today? Um, I think it's a whole heap of mix up uh, <laughs> you know, um, I, I can't really make a particular comment about that because we've got such a range of responses out there, some of which are more likely to survive and have impact than others. 
But the fact that those politics exist is important. Um, the fact that there are young people out there who are still on it and who want to challenge injustice and who understand the importance of intersectionality and you know making the links between the different groups who've been oppressed historically i think that is all good and um you know it's very easy isn't it to tear holes in other people's practice and say this is to this or that is to that you know personally i'm i'm wary of anything that's too nationalistic whether it's white nationalism or black nationalism i find both of them equally um potentially dangerous and um they don't to me serve my um vision of a world in which people treat each other with respect regardless of color race gender sexuality transgender all of those things to me um you know we need to as i often say focus on our commonalities rather than our differences but in a nutshell in answer to that question how i feel about those things i'm glad that they exist and i recognize that we each find our ways towards the answers at a different rate at a different speed at different times um but the fact that we are on it and we're thinking about anti-colonialism and thinking about liberation and thinking about sexism that is important and i really think it's even more important now given the global context that we're in definitely thank you so much and so there's like so many questions but i'm only going to ask two more because we i understand that you've been talking a whole lot <laughs> and i'm cognizant of both of your time um so um someone asked an excellent question all the questions have been excellent, so let me stop. Um, this discussion has been a breath of fresh air. My question is about coalition building and anti-Black racism. How do we have a conversation without erasing the experiences, experiences of the most marginalized and how usual is political Blackness in 2021? Hmm. How do we have a conversation? I think conversation always starts with listening skills. You know, um, some of us are very garrulous, some of us are very self-opinionated, but to have a real conversation, particularly with people who've been marginalized or who have not been afforded a voice, it is really important to listen, really important to listen. Um, what was the second part of the question, Jamie? I guess how useful political blackness is in That's right. I, 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 I recognize the importance of being able to identify who I am, who we are, um, and to determine our own labels. But I also think that political blackness went beyond skin tone it went beyond colorism. It went beyond those kinds of, you know, underneath the paintwork kind of differences to recognize that what gave us unity and common voice was an experience, a collective experience. In our case, a collective experience of, of, of racism, gender and, and class oppression. So, I still think personally that political blackness has its place and I still operate on um, the belief, the hope that all oppressed people, regardless of their skin tone, can see the power of coming together and speaking with, if not a unified voice, a collective, voice that extends solidarity to those who may be experiencing things differently and um, a sympathy and an empathy with those who um, may live different lives. Okay, so one last question here. 
um, how did you grapple with, um, someone asked, how did you grapple with black women's resistance while also thinking about the newness of gender womanhood born from colonialism? And how did that impact the way you approached a kick in the belly? How did I grapple with, just repeat that grapple, again. Yeah, how did you grapple with black women's resistance while also thinking about the newness of gender slash womanhood? Um, newness, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. To me, gender and womanhood is kind of central to black feminist resistance. Uh, I can't separate the two out. Um, I know there are always new discussions about what that means and what it looks like, but it was never really an issue for me. I never really had to reconcile those different concepts. Uh, well, I just want to leave off with a comment that someone said on our YouTube live. They said, I'm currently writing a paper on Black feminism and referencing Heart of the Race a lot. Love the book. Thank you so much for giving Black British feminism a voice. Um, and I want to just say that this has been a dream come true to have this conversation with you, Miss Miss Dodzi. Um, and I'm so grateful that Karima and I were, are connected too because I'm learning so much. And there's so many people who are learning from your work and continue to learn from your work. And like I said before, and I'll keep plugging again, please support Miss Dodzi's A Kick in the Belly please read, I put the link um, in the chat, read, expand your black feminist praxis and consciousness. And this is what the Afro feminisms in Europe series is about to learn from black women from around the world. Um, and I just wanna th th say thank you so much. Like you, we are literally speaking with <laughs> a black feminist pioneer. So uh, this is amazing. So thank you so much, Ms. Dodson. Karima, you did an excellent job, thank you so much. Well, let me just say to you, Jamie, it was a pleasure, it was an honor, and um, um, always a pleasure to talk to you and to think that there are people around the United States as well as across the world who are engaging with, with these issues. I should say that, you know, um, there are many, many black women who were part of our movement um, because I've written a book, my name comes to the fore, but I, I, I just want to give um, give thanks and, and reference to the unnamed women who've been part of this, this, this journey and um, recognize that we need to pour a libation for all of them, um, of whom I'm just a representative, really. But thank you. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you, yes. Go ahead, Karim, I'm sorry. No, I just want to say thank you. Thank you both for this fruitful evening today. I, I really enjoyed it. So thank you so much. Yes, and thank you. Everyone saying thank you so much. Solidarity from Canada. Thank you, this was so affirming. And one more time, Rhoda, I want to just shout you out again. Thank you for um, <laughs> the archives. Thank you for being behind the scenes. But once again, Ms. Dodsey, thank you, Karima. Thank you, thank you to the Black Culture Archives. Um, and this uh, YouTube will, or this event will live on Black Radicals YouTube. So you'll be able to have access and to continue to learn and go back. So thank you so much again and be safe everyone. And thank you. until we meet again, thank you so much. Let's hope we meet soon. I, <laughs> I hope so. I, <laughs> and you'll have to, like I said, autograph my books. <laughs> so thank you so much. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.